you very much for this very kind introduction. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Mark. Thanks to all of you for sticking around. Um, I have a few questions for you. So, all right, so you all know this. Um, but let's, let's start this. So, one question. How many of you have a major in neuropathology? Raise your hand. No, seriously. How many of you have a major in neuropathology? All right, nobody, apparently. All right, fine. When is the last time you had a brain scan? All right, 20 minutes? 20 years, all right, well, we should get uh, uh, you know, a, a payment plan for this. Um, and then how safe, how affordable, are you, and how efficient are your drugs? Um, all right, so these are just a few questions to think about during this talk. So I can bet that a few of you here, unfortunately, have a neuropathology. The problem is we have about 100 billion cells in our brain, and that's more the number of stars that are in the universe. In order for there to be significant damage, you, you cannot just wait for a few cells to be knocked off. You have to have major damage in your brain before there are, there are symptoms. So the issue here is that we only pick up neuropathologies when it's too late. And uh, two billion right now have a, uh, a major brain disorder or um, a, a CNS disorder, 100 million in America. For Alzheimer's alone, well, in California, you will have, uh, by 2030, um, Alzheimer's will rise at five times the speed of the population rise in California. Uh, this translates into huge medical costs. You have about $100 billion a year for Alzheimer's, $42 billion for schizophrenia, $35 billion for, or $37 for depression. And uh, interestingly, here are a few facts. Sleep disorders are the number one reason why Alzheimer's patients are um, institutionalized, not dementia. Uh, disturbed sleep plays a role in all of the pathologies I mentioned before. All right. So we have 7 million people in America who have a sleep disorder, and only 4 million of them have a sleep test. Uh, and uh, Paul Jacobs mentioned something about those. So why are there so few? Well, that's why. <laughs> so we have to do something about this. This gentleman has a problem sleeping in his own bed at home without any uh, wires. We bring him into the hospital. We, put, we, we rub his skin. We put wires all over his head and his body. And then the analysis is done this way. This is a 30-second snapshot of the activity uh, that his body generates throughout all these sensors. This is all scored manually by technicians. And uh, the problem with that is that it's inaccurate, it's costly, it's uncomfortable. And uh, it's, been, it's been the case for um, way too long. So let's talk about then the drugs that people take when they don't know how to sleep. Um, um, I mean, how they can sleep. So basically, the most prescribed drug in the world for sleep in the 90s was this one, Halcyon here. Did anybody hear about it, Halcyon? All right, so a few facts about Halcyon. It was used in 90 countries. It was uh, restricted in 11 countries. It was banned for psychiatric disorders uh, in the UK in 91. Uh, it was redosed in America um, from half a milligram to a quarter milligram. And um, finally, Abjohns, the drug maker, had to acknowledge that uh, it caused you know, all kinds of psychiatric um, side effects. So here are some of them. So all these people were taking this drug without knowing this, obviously. Uh, there was a lady in Hurricane, Utah, who stabbed her mother uh, the, night of her, uh, uh, the night before her birthday and uh, sued the company and won. There was a, a habitant of this place here who was taking the drug for some time as well. You don't want him to get, get too angry either. So it affects all of us. Uh, in my own family, uh, there was a case and something I've never spoken about before, uh, certainly in public, and I guess my colleagues don't know and my investors in the audience don't know either, but I hope they'll forgive me. Um, my, fa my father was um, someone who took Halcyon, and uh, it uh, had uh, tremendous side effects, so much so that uh, on the day of my 10th birthday, nobody called because he had been arrested. He had threatened someone with a weapon and uh, was arrested for that. 
and uh, eventually was pardoned um, when they found out uh, his toxicology report. But in any case, these things have tremendous consequences, and I just want you to understand that. So do any of you have one of those here? <laughs> I don't. Uh, I know that Mark uh, has been in one of those, so perhaps given that his brain has been analyzed before, uh, I'll invite Mark to uh, step out of, of the stage uh, for a few seconds. We're going to prepare him for a surprise at the end of the talk. Thank you. All right, how about this? It's a little cheaper. It's only, it's only about a million dollars. No, no, two, sorry, two million dollars. Um, so that's, that's you know, a, a supercomputer, and we're told that there'll be a model of your brain running uh, on this computer, and uh, we will be able to understand you and analyze you in real time in about 10 years. But we don't have those. I'm pretty confident all of you have something like that, right, a cell phone. So, and it's not, yeah, it's a little cheaper. So what I'm going to tell you uh, is that it turns out we can use a very old technology called the EEG, brain waves, and, um, do the following thing. This person went into REM sleep, but you wouldn't know it were not for the inclusion of all these other sensors, right? So muscle tone, eye movements, and so on. But what we're going to do, we're just going to focus on this one channel from the brain, and we're going to do quite a bit of mathematics on it. Um, this here is just the conventional analysis, so you have time on the, on the x-axis, frequency on the y-axis, and you usually don't see anything above 20 hertz. It's one night of sleep using conventional methods. And this above here is what I call the dark matter. We know that the brain is able to produce very high frequency information, but we don't have access to it. So we use this one channel of EEG, so voltage over time. We have this spectrogram. We um, do some mathematics, we normalize it, and then we create a map. So this is what this map looks like. So here every dot corresponds to 30 seconds of brain activity, um, and it hasn't been analyzed more than this, uh, and it turns out that if you superimpose the results of the manual scoring on this map, you can see that each waking and sleep state has its own biomarker, has its own signature. Everything can be separated. Everything can be read. Uh, I think that's what uh, also Paul was referring to in terms of the thesis. But that was a few years ago. What can we do now? Well, it turns out that we can actually increase the spectral resolution and the temporal resolution of these maps and give you access to your own brain, not in 10 years, and not with a very expensive scanner, and not with a very expensive supercomputer. We can do it right away. We can do it right now, and you can do it in your homes. So if you look now, it turns out that we can open all of this up. And if you look at what is in red, <laughs> yes, you look great. Um, <laughs> what, 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 what is in red here corresponds to REM sleep. What is in gr green is stage two. Uh, you have different areas of the brain which produce different neuromarkers. So you have uh, the thalamus, you have the cortex, you have the hippocampus. All of these different structures have a, have a unique signature here, and that means that we can actually find out if you have a problem in your hippocampus, in your cortex, or any other brain structure. So this is a map. So what this means is we can now, we have access to all of this without putting any electrodes. So, We've discovered something rather interesting. If you look at the red dots here, it appears that they form two different distributions. Stop petting him. Um, <laughs> so it, it, whether the data has been uh, scored manually or automatically. And what this means here, these are two different nights, two people. And uh, we have discovered a new human sleep state. REM is not REM. It's not one state. It's actually two stages. When what this means is that we may actually have a neural correlate of dreaming. We're not sure about this yet, but we know there are two stages. In fact, these uh, two people spent about a year looking at the data at a one second resolution to make sure that we actually did not um, um, see a state when in fact there were artifacts. So there is a new human sleep state for sure. We know that. All right. So if we just focus on this new sleep state and we look at these four different patients on top, I'm going to ask you a very simple question here. If you look at these pairs, one, two, three, four, do you think that I'm showing you two nights from the, uh, from, the, from the same patient, or do you think that these are different people? OK, who thinks it's the same patient? For, OK, raise your hand. OK, right, good. Well, it turns out that these are actually twins. So, and we can pick it up now using their brain waves, which is rather astonishing. So we're building now a large database of uh, biomarkers with all kinds of partners. We have. Uh, a partnership we'll announce uh, tomorrow with a pharmaceutical company. 
And the idea is to have biomarkers for schizophrenia, for Parkinson's, for um, uh, you know, all kinds of psychiatric disorders in order to give you access to your own brain. So how are we going to do this? Well, how are we going to have the world talk to us? And um, again, we're going to use someone who has a cell phone, I'm pretty sure, right? And we're going to put his brain waves on his cell phone. Uh, we'll use someone who has a BlackBerry, and we'll put his brain waves on his BlackBerry. And all you guys, we can put your, your brain waves on whatever it is that you're using. So, and that's, that's how we will actually find out in real time if you have any kind of neuropathology. That's the plan. We're building now the world's largest database to do this. And it's, you won't have to rely on, your, on you know, an alarm clock uh, with all due respect to some other companies. This will be done on your cell phone. And it will be done for your, with, with uh, uh, we, we will look for neuropathology. So it turns out that we can do this also with sensors, um, but which were developed also uh, by Mike Shee here at UCSD. We have a partnership. But we really wanted uh, Mark to look funny today, so we're not using those. Um, and, uh, but with those sensors, you can actually record your heart rhythm through your shirt. So this is comp not only is it non-invasive, but you don't need to actually touch the skin. Um, so there are all kinds of other experiments we can do. We can try this on different, on different structures. But uh, let's see what we have here. Okay, very good. Does the cameraman want to come here? So this is uh, Mark's brain. Can we see it on the screen? On drugs. Hang on. All right, Mark Hodash, you have a brain. And uh, blink. Oops, do you see it? OK, blink again. Ready, go. Very good. Very good. So this is the kind of stuff we're doing. That was easy. <laughs> we, um, we built this for Ted Med, by the way. Um, we spent about. Uh, I don't want to keep it, though. You, you don't have to. You don't, you, don't, you don't have to. You don't have to. But uh, we, we did this over the last, uh, the last week to have something to show you, to give you an idea. Um, and uh, this is. This is a, a big project. We are at the end of the beginning, but uh, we want to build the world's biggest database. We want to put your brain on a cell phone, and we want to tell you in real time what is happening to your brain before you have cognitive disorders. So thank you very much. <laughs>